Hello, and welcome to Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. We are so glad you've joined us. Before we jump into today's episode, we would like to tell you about one of the resources we use at Higher Aim to encourage hearts and empower lives, and that's our monthly Bible teaching letter. In each letter, Dr. Kurt Dodd gives you a more in-depth look at the topic of one of his sermons and helps you dive deeper as you study God's Word. The letter is delivered to your home each month and is absolutely free. To begin receiving your monthly Bible teaching letter, visit our website at higheraim.org and click on the teaching letter option at the top of the screen. You can also call our help center at 1-800-491-4400 as operators are standing by now to help you register for the Bible teaching letter. We hope this resource is a blessing to you as you continue to grow in your walk with Christ. Now, please enjoy today's message from Dr. Kurt Dodd. Well, today we have come to the last part of this picture-perfect scene of the Messiah. There in verses 8 through 20 of the first chapter, I'm going to read them to you and then take you very quickly to help you get caught up where we have been Uh, And then we're going to take the next step to get a glimpse of something that many of us just miss out on. You ready? Let's read verses 8 through 20 here. Here's what the Scripture says. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering, and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Every time I read that, I think to myself, what a picture. That had to over. Whelm, John. And I pray that when you read the Word of God, you allow it to sink deep inside of you. Allow it to overwhelm and overpower you. As I shared with you, this is the perfect picture of the Messiah. And in the last several weeks, we we have looked at this picture of authority, Jesus being the Alpha and the Omega, And then uh, this picture of partnership, where we are in partnership with the Lord and we are in partnership with each other to advance the kingdom. And that's very, very important because God wants us to realize 
that we become the agents, if you will, through which he speaks, the messengers through which he speaks to our world and our culture. And let me stop and say very quickly, today we have a a real problem because churches have a tendency to want to so identify with our culture that they lose the voice to speak to the culture. And I pray that you will never become a chameleon, that you relish the privilege, the honor that God has given you to represent him and his word when it even contradicts our culture and the direction of our culture. If you do not stand as salt and light, there is no hope for our land. And so that's important. But there's also a picture of power, as we've seen in the previous times, uh, as we've looked at this passage in detail. His voice, a powerful posture among the lampstands, a powerful image uh, describing who he is. And this is a, a wonderful thing. And what he is wearing attributes to that image. We've looked at his clothes, the distinction and the description of a high priest with great authority, his hair being white, a, a description of, of purity and wisdom, his eyes piercing right through. And you and I need to realize his eyes are still like that. This image of Jesus is the the picture that you and I need to have right now. This is who he is. This is what he looks like now. Do not think of him as an ancient Middle East young man. Don't think of him as now the lamb on the cross. Think about him as the king of kings, lord of lords, who is coming soon. This image that we're seeing, this perfect picture in the very last book of the Bible is here because this is the image that you and I must have. This is the photo in our mind that is painted with inspired words by the Holy Spirit of who Jesus is now. It is important that you see him like this now because he is like this now. It's very important. It's going to make a difference in how you live your life and how you handle difficulties. His eyes piercing through his feet like bronze glowing in a furnace. I told you that that's the only time in the entire scripture that phrase is ever used. A description of superiority, judgment, and authority. His voice like the sound of rushing waters, overpowering all voices. I pray that that's true for you, that Jesus' voice overpowers all other voices. Sadly, many of us, we just look for voices and listen to voices of our friends, of our family, of people who persuade us or speak for our culture. The voice that we need to hear is the voice that is like the voice of rushing waters. Listen to his voice, and we hear his voice as we stand upon his word and then his right hand. The Bible describes these seven stars, the angels, the pastors of these seven churches, And God wants us to be messengers, if you will, winning people to Christ, representing him to the world, committed to the local church. And then his mouth I I described here and gave you the insight that this sword coming out of his mouth is not a dagger, a small sword. It is an executioner's sword that brings judgment And so you and I need to realize that that is important. And his face, well, when John saw him, his face was like the sun shining in all brilliance. And then the response, John said, I fell at his feet as though dead. There are times in worship that the only real posture 
is on our face. I don't know if you've ever had a time in your life where in your time alone with God, you fell on your face. The reason we fall on our face is not to get Jesus to see us, not to get Jesus to hear us. It's because we have had an encounter with him, and it is the overflow and a response that we cannot help. The problem is that we sometimes think that we really worship, and we have really worshiped when we have been emotionally uh, uh, encouraged and we feel good because we like a melody and we like the words, and we like the ones who have sung the words and the melody, and that just kind of blessed us. Real worship happens when you are overcome with the presence of God. But many of us, we in, in a corporate setting, we have such a difficult time expressing ourselves. Don't ever feel like the expression of what you do with your hands, your your voice, uh, with your posture, don't ever be confused thinking that if you lift your hands, you're worshiping, or that that puts you into the presence of God. You need to realize that He's here. You're already in His presence. But what would cause you to fall on your face would be simply an encounter with Him. I pray that if that happens in our church, that all of a sudden there are people on their face that you would not be surprised, that you would not be distracted. But it is interesting, John fell on his face, not in a corporate setting, but it was a personal, private encounter with Christ. You know, when we're in a corporate gathering, we are so uh, mindful of other people looking at us. Uh, I had a lady that, that passed away several years ago who was like my mom, my second mom growing up. Uh, she would never look at a soloist when they sang in church, uh, what she would do, and, and I noticed that e even when I was in elementary school and would be sitting with uh, uh, her family, and what she would do in worship, uh, when someone got up to sing, she would duck her head like that. And, and I asked her one time, why do you do that? She said, because if I look at them, I don't want them to be embarrassed. And I'm going, I don't understand that. But her focus was being so concerned about uh, what someone was feeling when they were on the platform. And she did not want them to feel uncomfortable, so she didn't look at them. Now, I know that may sound strange to you, but the problem is many of us, we're looking to other people. We're looking to performers. We're looking to, to people who lead but what calls us to a real encounter and a real response like John had, falling on his face as though dead, was that he had an encounter with Christ. You know, I, I pray that what would happen in your life and my life, that this would not be the only worship that we experience weekly but that every day you spend time in God's Word to have an encounter with Christ and you are so alone with Him that you don't think twice if there is a special encounter with Him that you have just fall on your face, whether you have carpet or a hardwood floor or linoleum, 
You go on your face because you're not worried about what anybody else thinks about you. That is just the response physically that comes because of an overpowering experience with Christ. Now, some of you are looking at me, you know my Texas phrase, like a calf at a new gate. You've never seen it before. You've never heard of it before. But I pray that your worship and your intimacy with Jesus is so real that you can relate to John. And that in your quiet time and your encounter with Christ, it is easy for you to get off your bed and get on the floor. Not that getting on the floor will get you to Christ, but the encounter with Christ will put you on the floor. Too many of us are too content allowing our spiritual lives to keep us seated rather than allowing us to come into his presence. And God wants us to respond appropriately. You cannot make this kind of stuff up. You, can, you and I are, are never to be manipulated by a crowd to do something in worship, but rather desire to have an encounter that just puts us on our face. I pray that you desire that in your life, that, that God would become so real to you and your intimacy with Jesus would be so powerful that he could have his way with you and his presence would be so thick in your place of worship that you would go immediately on your face. Many of us were too busy trying to stand instead of being in a place of prostrate worship. We sing that song during this season, Angels Prostrate Fall. But many of us have never been prostrate, prone on our face. And you and I should not think that being prostrate before the Lord is something that is abnormal. It is to be expected. And you and I need to desire that God would give us such an encounter with him that he drives us not just to our knees, but on our face. There is another thing I want you to see. I want you to look at the uh, appropriate response of being in God's presence and what God does when John goes to his face. Because this is the last picture that John leaves us with the Messiah, our Savior, our soon coming Lord. Here it is. It is a picture of blessing and comfort in verse 17 and 18. Allow me to read these words in verse 17 and 18 to you again. Here's what it says. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. The, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the the keys of death and Hades. Now let me just tell you what all of this means and put some application into it in these last moments we have together. First of all, keys are a symbol of authority. Uh, when someone was, was going to be honored in front of a city, the mayor would often give them the keys to the city. And it is a picture of authority. This word Hades is the description of the unseen world, which death is the portal. And Jesus has the keys to Hades and death because he overcame. He overcame. He holds the keys. And that's important for us to understand. His right hand upon John is critical because that is that of a description of comfort and blessing. And that's what Jesus does with John when he falls on his face. He places his right hand on him and then he speaks. 
And I want you to see a couple of things here. Blessing comes from whose hand is on you. Remember that. Blessing comes from whose hand is upon you. Many of us grow up wanting to have the hand of blessing from a father. And maybe you never received that. Let me tell you something. That's okay because there is a greater father who wants to place his right hand upon you and say, I have you. I am pleased with you. And you need to hear that. If you've turned from sin and placed your faith in Christ, Jesus is pleased with you. And you need to visualize in your mind his hand, his right hand upon you. Not what you have done, but because of who he is. Blessing comes from whose hand is upon you. And you and I ought to have the desire to make sure that we sense God's hand upon us always and not live like it doesn't make a difference. It does. But I also want to tell you, comfort comes from two different things, from what he says and two, who he is. What did, what did he say? Do not be afraid. I, I honestly got to tell you, in this culture of our pandemic, which is moving toward now a year since we first heard about COVID-19, and when it was first discovered and began to make the news, and by the way, I heard, I don't know how verified this is, that there were cases of COVID in our city a year ago this time. But it had not been shared. No one knew the impact of this virus. But I need to tell you that uh, you don't need to be afraid even though you don't know what the future holds. I look at our church. Um, we're not the same church as we were. We, we are so uh, fractured because of not being able to come together with freedom. The majority of our congregation is online uh, because of the fear, uh, because of the reality of what creates the fear. No one wants to get COVID. No one wants to get infected. And who knows what the future holds. Uh, today, as I was driving to church, I, I looked at a couple of office buildings that we're, we are being built, or are being built right now, and I'm thinking to myself, will they ever be full again? I look at our church building, which is huge, and I wonder to myself, Will we ever in our lifetime see churches packed to the brim and people no longer being afraid of infection? Will we ever see that? I have no idea. But here's the deal. We don't have to have any idea what the future holds. We just need to hear what Jesus says. And here's what he says. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of what's going to happen next. Don't be afraid of what is happening now. Your eyes need to be on Christ. And then he is described very clearly as the first and last. Again, we've heard that before, the Alpha and the Omega, the living one, the risen one, the powerful one. And you and I need to understand that. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you feel the hand of blessing and comfort upon you? Do you feel God's blessing upon you? Do you feel God's comfort upon you? I'm going to just tell you, I really think that there are a lot of us who don't. And I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why I think that many of us 
don't feel the hand of blessing and comfort. And then I'm going to tell you a little story and we'll be through. Number one, many of us don't feel the hand of God's blessing and comfort upon us because we're looking for a sign and not the Savior. We're, we're looking for God to do something rather than looking for Him. Second, many of us are wanting to stand on an experience rather than standing on His Word. God wants us to stand on His Word and not stand on an experience. If you're looking more for a spiritual experience rather than God's Word, you're never going to really sense His hand of blessing and comfort upon you. The security and blessing is not because of an experience. An experience follows the hand of blessing and comfort. Get them in the right order. Three, if you're living by feeling and not by faith, you will not have that sense of God's blessing and comfort upon you. And if you did, it would only be fleeting. God wants you to have that sense of blessing and comfort all the time. Four, I would tell you, if you're basing your worth on what you've done rather than whose you are, you'll never sense a hand of comfort and blessing upon you. If your present reality Fifth, it is determined by what you see now instead of who you should be seeing now. You will never experience that feeling and that sense of comfort and blessing. And last, I will tell you, if you have forgotten how powerful our Savior really is right now and forever, you will never have that sense of comfort and blessing. This picture that we have spent so long on in this first chapter of the book of Revelation is critical. If you don't get this, you'll not understand the rest of the book. This is the image of our soon coming king. This is the picture This is the selfie, if you will, that the Savior wants us to grab hold of. And He is a powerful Savior. He is an authority. He is the authority. He is the King. And His presence should overwhelm us and overcome us. I told you I was going to tell you a little story. It's a real simple story. It's a great one. I came across it the other day, and I thought, oh, man, I need to tell my church. Years ago, a young Jewish man came to a, a Presbyterian music evangelist by the name of Ackley and said, why should I worship a dead Jew? To which Ackley replied, but Jesus lives. He lives. I tell you, he is not dead, but he lives here and now. Jesus Christ, he goes on to say, is more alive today than ever before. I can prove it by my own experience as well as the testimony of countless thousands of other people who have followed Christ. He would go on to win that young Jewish man to faith in Jesus Christ, and he went home, and he penned the words to this song. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to in part. You ask me how. I know he lives. Say it with me. He lives within my heart. You and I need to realize Jesus lives. Jesus reigns. Jesus rules, and he's coming back to this world, and he holds the title deed of this entire universe, and you and I either have the choice and the privilege of bowing our knee to him now and be blessed and having 
a sense of great comfort as well for the rest of your life. Or one day, the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone will declare, everyone will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Why don't you say that out loud with me? Jesus is Lord. Say it again. Jesus is Lord. Live it. Believe it. Walk like that. Stand on the Word and live as the agents of reconciliation in our culture now. Because if you don't, how in the world is this world going to ever see Jesus stand because he has his hand of blessing and comfort upon you. And if you don't sense that, it's maybe because, last, you've never turned from sin and placed your faith in Christ. And today, I want to invite you to do that. And we want to show you how. If you're watching online or by television, call that 800 number right now. Someone will show you how to give your life to Christ. Thanks for watching Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. Visit higheraim.org for more free resources. There, you can access our daily devotions, sign up for our monthly teaching letter, even download the Higher Aim app, and so much more. Just go to higheraim.org to get started.